It's 5.30, so I'll call the meeting to order, and if everyone could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. We have one modification so far, and I'd like to move item E uh, under number four items for commission action to be the first item before item A. Do the commissioners have any other modifications? That None for me, sir. None for me, Leonard. Okay. With that, could I have a motion? I make a motion that uh, we adopt the agenda. We move um, item E uh, before A. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Next item on the agenda is uh, con common consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion that we approve the common consent agenda. I'll second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? My motion carried. Next item on the agenda is presentation of the 2017 audit. Good evening. Uh, Neil Phillips of Jared Gilmore and Phillips prepared your independent audit for this year. Uh, there is a couple letters that's in your <coughs> audit. Let's skip past those letters and dive right into the blue book there. Would these be, in the past we've had a management plan, is that what? Yep, those this? are management letter and presentation <clears throat> letters. I was okay. gonna come back to those towards the end. Okay. okay. Page one and two is the independent auditor's report. The first paragraph talking about what we audited, audited being the city of independence as of December 31st, 2017. The second paragraph talks about management's responsibilities and the fact that everything in this document, they're your numbers, your representations with what happened during the year and how you ended the year. The next couple of paragraphs talks about the auditor's responsibilities and the fact that we audit following the auditing standards that are generally accepted in the United States of America. And then we also follow what they call the Kansas Municipal Audit and Accounting Guide. Down towards the bottom, you're going to see a bold heading that says Basis for Adverse Opinion on Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. The city actually does not follow GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Mm -hmm. In the state of Kansas, we're allowed to call, we follow what we call the Regulatory Basis of Accounting. It's kind of a, a hybrid of, the ca of cash basis. It's cash basis accounting, but it also includes encumbrances and any obligations of the city. They call it Kansas cash basis and budget laws because it comes down to two things with the statute. You can't spend the money unless you had it, already have it set aside, and you can't spend the money unless you have public approval. That's the budget basis. Go through that public approval usually through your, you know, in August when you do your budgets. But, uh, and then that's why your capital projects are specifically approved because they don't get budgeted in that normal process, but you actually have public approval with each individual one. So I'm going to have you turn to page two, third paragraph down, unmodified opinion on the regulatory basis of accounting. In our opinion, the financial statement referred to above present fairly in all material respects the aggregate cash and uncovered cash balances of the City of Independence as of December 31, 2017, the aggregate receipts and expenditures for the year then ended in accordance with the financial reporting provisions of the Kansas Municipal Audit and Accounting Guide described in Note 1. So what you have there is what they call an unmodified opinion on the regulatory basis of accounting. And you say, what does that mean to me? Well, that means based on the testing we did, we feel like the numbers that are presented on page three and four, and actually you'll read later through the entire book, are of materially accurate representation of what happened during the year and how you ended the year based on the testing we did. So we feel like the numbers you have before you are accurate. 
The net last paragraph talks about the supplemental information, and that does tell you that we did audit everything that's been in, this, in the bound book when you read through that paragraph. Page three and four, it's the large, it brings everything up into one statement format. This is to show users at a glance that you were in compliance with the cash basis laws. That's what the KMAG actually deems this statement. If you look at the, it's, let's see, it's the fifth column over from the left there, you've got ending unencumbered cash. So just at a glance, if you look down through there, if any of those funds ended negative, that would be in violation of Kansas statute. As you're glancing down through there, you are going to see that the city did have a couple funds that ended up being negative. And just like everything, there's always an exception to the rule. If you have a signed grant agreement or a signed loan agreement or signed bonds, you are allowed to go negative because you're waiting on that reimbursement. Because most of your grants, you know, require you to spend the money, then you, they mail you a check later to reimburse you. In your case, as you glance down through there, you're going to see all of your funds that are listed there are grant funds or loan funds in which you did have proceeds coming back in in 2018 that would have covered those deficits. I do like statement number one. They, they changed this a few years ago. They changed the titles a little bit. I think it helps the users understand the financial statement a little better. Like the very top line is your general fund. Uh, you can see there it started the year out $1.7 million. We brought in 6.2, spent 7.8, so ended the year with $88,000 of cash, unencumbered cash. That's what a lot of times you guys will refer to as your cash carryover. You know, we talk about cash carryover amounts, or sometimes you'll hear it as called reserves. You actually ended the year with $88,000 in the general fund. The next section there, and that's what I think is kind of neat about this, because as we talk about the, the fact that the city has $8.7 million of unencumbered cash balances, we only had $88,000 in the general fund. This next section, they call it special purpose funds. And most of those funds are collected for a specific purpose. And that purpose is usually laid out by statute that says you have to spend that money for that particular purpose. Glance down through there, like the second one down, special alcohol. Every time um, the liquor, local liquor stores sell something, some of the money goes to the state, comes back to you. Part of it gets put in the general fund, part of it gets put in the special parks fund, part of it gets put in a special alcohol fund. Those funds can only be used for those purposes. Can't use it to wear a water line if something happened. Has to be used based on statute. And as you glance down through there, all of those programs in the special revenue section are monies that are set aside for a purpose. Then partway down the page, you've got your bond and interest fund, in which that's the monies that you're setting aside to make your bond payments. Then the capital project funds down there towards the bottom, and they continue on to the next page. Those are your capital projects that you had going on as a city. Those are the specifically approved items. You know, we talk about your budget process being the public comes and helps you. Know, you have your public hearings and stuff for your budget in August. This is specifically approved by project by line. That's where it gets its public approval. That's why a lot of times your uh, guys that are doing these projects, they'll come back to you with a $1,000 change order because they know if they don't get that change order approved by you, they can't get paid by statute. That's why they bring those change orders back to you because that's your specific approval for each of those projects. Then the very last section down there towards the bottom of page four is the business funds. And they changed that name to call them the business funds because they want you to realize that those are treated as a business in the state of Kansas. Meaning once you pay all the bills of that particular fund, you can use those profits for anything. So you want to try to build profits up in those funds. 
again, it is a cash basis. It doesn't include infrastructure. So we haven't put a price on all our water lines and, and capitalized that and depreciated it out over its useful life. That is a cash balance. It is important that you try to build those cash balances up here. Uh, we do 32 city audits, and we really press on you guys to remember you've got to save cash. That cash is what you would use to levy to get the next loan or to get the next grant. You've always got to have matching funds, and if you don't have those funds set aside, you aren't going to get those loans or those grants. Vice versa, you know, you could have a problem that could happen tomorrow. Uh, a lift station could go out, and that's a thirty, forty thousand dollar expenditure right there for a pump. You've got to have money set aside to be able to fund those type of projects or those emergencies that would come up. And those are the funds that you're going to be able to use to do those type of things. All those funds up above that, we can't use that cash for those situations. You know, we can't use the special parks fund because we had a pump station go out. We can only come down and use the money that's sitting here in the water and sewer fund. Uh, Excuse me. Yes. <clears throat> you said that in, in those operate like a business and the cash reserve can be used elsewhere. Yes. So can you use the reserve from water and sewer in another need in another area, or is that restricted just to water sewer? No, nope. you can use a water and sewer fund. Per, once all the bills are paid, you can use that money for anything. Okay. Actually, we have a lot of cities that will actually try to make transfers into the general fund from the utility funds that help lower property taxes because sometimes, you know, like your water customers are outside of city limits. And so to be able to get money into the general fund from those people that are outside your property tax assessment area, by moving monies into there from the water fund, you're also collecting money for the general fund from some of those outside of your assessment. Okay. Thank you. So like I said, $8.7 million of unencumbered cash, cash carryover. But you got to remember, as you're looking back up through there, cash balances by fund. I am going to point out the general fund sitting at $88,000. That was pretty low. If you went back in the last few years, you've been up over a million dollars. Your first tax payment, and this is why I'm throwing this out here, your first tax payment doesn't come till the end of January. And if you are following Kansas cash basis laws, says you cannot issue a check if you don't have the money in the bank. And that's by fund. We don't care that we have $8 million in the bank. If the general fund doesn't have enough cash, we are not supposed to issue those checks. That would be a violation of statute. With $88,000 of cash in the general fund and the first tax payment doesn't come to the end of January, you've got the possibility of violating statute in January right there because you could get to that situation. It's important that you at least figure out a way to budget at least a month's worth of cash carryover in the general fund. That's, that's got to be at least a minimum of that so that you can make it to the end of February to be able to legally pay those bills. A lot of my cities that I do audits for, they have unwritten, or some of them actually have put it in writing, that they're going to try to carry over a certain amount. Uh, the business funds, a lot of times, they'll try to get to a six-month reserve on those. Six months' worth of expenditures. One to two months of expenditures in the general fund, it would be a safe in my opinion, cash carryover to be able to bring into the new year. Because, like I said, you've got to make it till you get that first tax payment to be able to pay bills. Questions on statement one? That's the one we'll spend the most time on there. I think it tells the best story of the, of the city when you look at it, the cash. And think about it as the cash carryover numbers. Because down there towards the very bottom, you can see, actually, I'm going to point the very, at the totals. You started the year out with $9.5 million. We brought in 20 spent 21 and ended the year with $8.7 million. But as you're glancing back up through there, you know, like your water fund, you can see it was down by a little bit, uh, a little bit over $100,000. But uh, the uh, replacement fund and the utility and the sanitation fund, uh, we're up. Uh, your utility stayed pretty consistent. Uh, the majority of the reason for your decrease in cash would be one, the general fund, in which you had prior. I mean, I'm not making light of it, but you did have some monies in the general fund from the prior years, some donations that you received to spend on 
on your administrative offices. And so that cash was spent down. Plus, if you look at the, all the projects, look at those negatives that are up there. There's quite a few negatives sitting there in which in 18, uh, management was able to turn around and they drew quite a bit of that money down because we had loan proceeds out, out there waiting to be drawn down from the state of Kansas with that revolving loan. So a lot of those project funds brought the cash back in, which would have brought our total cash back up. Does that kind of make sense? <clears throat> All right, Paige. So on yes. the business funds, you've got water, sewer, utility, then grinder pump replacement. You've set that up as a reserve fund yourself as a city, as a business fund. It's just been prior utility profits that have been set up over there for that specific purpose. So you're saving that money to replace some of those grinder pumps. Okay. It's not that it's specifically by statute. That's, that's something you've internally set some of those profits aside for. So under the business fund, you can designate certain items to save money for that it. you're right that's yeah. kind of your reserve so what we said looking at the cost to replace a grinder pump we'll set up a line item mm -hmm. that will designate so much money to go in so that at the time we need to replace it we'll have the cash so you could do it for other items right yes also. you could yes you could i see water tower replacement funds <clears throat> sometimes or i'll see a water replacement line fund sometimes because, you know, our infrastructure is getting pretty old, and you're not the mm -hmm. only city sitting in that same situation. We've got to be able to set monies aside to, to fix a neighborhood's water lines or sewer lines. Um, the monies that are up in those special revenue funds are all guided by statute of how you can spend the money. And there are some reserve funds up there, but they're guided by statute. Like if you put money into the municipal equipment reserve fund, you can only spend it that way. You can't get it back out. Once you put it there, it's done. It's stuck in the municipal equipment fund, and you have to buy municipal equipment. Capital improvement project reserve funds are the same way. But by setting this up down here as a business fund and setting cash aside, if you got into a situation, you could use some of that grinder pump money for something else rather than there's nothing by statute limiting that money. Does that kind of make sense? You set that un those profits aside for that, but you really could. There's no statute saying you couldn't spend it for something else if you needed to. Okay. Yeah. All right. So your yes. So your receipts would just be the amount that you designate to come from wherever, like grinder pump. If it's related to the sewer, it could come out of the sewer utility. Mm -hmm. If you have. Um, power generator it could come out of there if you have emergency vehicle fund it could come out of general fund and which shows revenue in there well the general fund if you you you're pretty limited on the general fund of spending the money out of there you okay. you're not supposed to transfer as money out of the general fund there's only certain reasons why you can transfer out of the general fund and usually the only transfers you can make are like equipment reserve or a capital improvement fund mm -hmm. in which that's setting monies to side uh, the general fund most of the time sets money aside into the ca uh, municipal equipment fund to buy police cars, those type of capital okay. expenditures. So then what we set up down here in the business fund should be related to a business operated yes. item. Like yes. it should relate to the water, sewer, sanitation. Yes. Or, I don't know, is the airport considered a... Uh, that's a general fund item, general fund. so that's back up towards the top. Yep. Yeah, okay. So Thank you. Now, there's nothing that says you can't spend once you pay all those profits. Again, that statute says once you pay all the expenses, you can spend the money. So you could use profits off of the water and sewer for the airport. Yeah. We it just couldn't, up, we couldn't the, save money for it yeah. that way. You can take money out of there and move it up, so to speak, but you can't take the money from the upper part and move it down. Right. Okay. okay. Once you moved it up, it'd be stuck up there. Okay. <laughs> All right, page five starts into the footnotes, the words to back up the numbers. Footnote number one uh, is the largest. Uh, if you pick up, I would say probably 95% of the cities in the state of Kansas, you're going to see the same footnote 
in footnote number one because it describes what Kansas cash basis and budget laws are. Talks about the differences between gap and cash basis. Talks about your budget process. It's got dates in there. Uh, turn to page eight, footnote number two, starts getting into information that's specific to the city. Uh, the first one we talk about compliance with Kansas statutes. And as you read down through there, you're going to see that we talk about the cash violations that are up in the front of the financial statements. But then about halfway through there, it says, the, however, there is an exception, KSA 10 1, 116 allows you to go negative in certain situations. Those certain situations, like I said, grant agreement, loan agreement, something that's signed saying you're going to get reimbursed. Very last sentence, though, we do note that you did violate uh, Kansas Statute 792935 in the general fund in which you did spend more than what you had budgeted for. Uh, it is not a penal statute. Nobody's going to go to jail over it. Uh, we would tell you we would like to not see you do that. Uh, I have seen an instance where a city had did it for four or five years in a row. You'll usually get a letter from the state that says stop doing that. Uh, but it's important that we try not to because that's our public approval. In your case, you did have some monies. Uh, that was those donation monies that were received in the prior year and you spent in 17 uh, management really feels like that's why they went over budget. Uh, if you get those donations in the same year you spend it, it can be what they call a budget extender, so it would, it would make that budget bigger. But once they cross the fiscal year, you've then got to do a new budget or do an amended budget to be able to spend them. So if we would have spent them in the same year we got them, it would have been okay. But since we crossed the year, we got the donations in the prior year and spent them in the new year, we probably really should have amended our budget. Minor mistake. I don't, you know, it's not a big deal in my mind. It's just important that we do watch that and don't let it happen habitually. The top of the next page, we did note that you also <laughs> violated a Kansas statute uh, with your publication of financial statements. Uh, as a city, we are required to publish in the local newspaper our financial statements uh, within 30 days after the end of the year. And last year, uh, we had noted that you had not published or they were late, so we're making that disclosure there. Footnote number three talks about deposits and investments. Uh, you are limited as a city of how we can invest our money and where we can invest our money. And the first couple of paragraphs talks about that fact. Last paragraph on page nine actually talks about what they call what the uh, concentration of credit risk. Well, a concentration of credit risk happens because we have more than 5% of our funds at any one bank. In your case, you had all of your monies held at two banks and which did cover with, you cover, helped that risk. FDIC steps up and helps with piece of, a piece of that in which you recovered $500,000 with securities pledged. Then the other $13 million that you had as cash in bank, and that, you always got to remember that's cash in bank prior to outstanding checks, outstanding deposits, all those type of things. All of that money was covered with securities pledged, meaning if the bank failed, the city would have got all their funds back. The top of the next page talks about refunding bonds. Uh, your bonds, the 2016A bonds, uh, refunded the 2010A bonds. Uh, according to your books and records, you have paid those off. But that money's sitting in escrow, waiting to actually call those bonds. And so we're required to disclose that, yes, they've been defeased but they still have not been paid off according to the state of $1.8 million. That money set in an account, in an account, in a trust account, earning interest, waiting to pay those off. Page 11 gets kind of small, a lot of information on page 11. It's all the uh, long-term debt of the city. It breaks it down by the different types. You have three different types. You have general obligation bonds. Uh, some revolving loans, and then capital leases down there towards the bottom. All allowable uh, vehicles to use to get money for the city to finance. You can see there we started the year out with $12,093,000. 
We issued $250,000 as an additional capital lease during this last year. Paid it down by 1.4, so actually ended the year with $10,931,000 of long-term debt for the city. And the next two pages show the payoff of that debt. It's always listed in five-year increments. You got the next five years, and then there are five-year chunks after that, because you know you do most of your city planning in five-year phases. And so this kind of helps you lay out and see what payments are going to be made. Glance down there towards the bottom with total principal and interest, you can see there uh, you're right about what 1.6 million, 1 1.5, 1 1.4, 1.3. A lot of times your bond council will try to keep those bond payments level when they're setting up payments for any new debt. And actually on page 13, uh, the only thing that's on page 13 there is the water revolving loan. At December 31st, 2017, you still had $604,000 of loan proceeds yet to be drawn down. So that was money that you could still draw on your water, water and sewer projects. Page 14 and 15, and actually continues on 16, is the capital leases that were on page 11. The dis I actually like the disclosure that's on page 11 a little better because it shows your principal, beginning principal minus your payments equals your ending balance, less, and then it shows your interest paid. Well, this is another disclosure requirement on pages 14, 15, and 16 of that exact same information but in the required format to show this is the total payment you see you have left, this is the imputed interest that's in it, and then the net present value of each of those different capital leases that are out there. So I'm not going to go through each one of those. Footnote number seven talks about industrial revenue bonds. You do have some bonds. You had six industrial revenue bonds at December 31st, 2017. Uh, we talk about the fact that they were outstanding, but there is no obligation of the city to pay, in which they had six of them at $18,725,000. You did rent a few items there in footnote number eight. We talk about operating leases being rent. In your case, you had a postage machine last year that you were renting, in which you have future payments. So we disclosed down there to the bottom, that's the future payments on that postage machine and which we've made an obligation for that is an operating lease not a not a capital lease we're not going to own that postage machine in the end that means we're just renting that postage machine footnote number nine talks about your capers it goes on uh, talks about the fact that you did contribute four hundred and twenty four thousand dollars into the caper system on behalf of your employees last year and then on the third paragraph down on page 17, I will point out, it does talk about the fact that uh, the net pension liability, the city's share of the state's shortfall, is $4,057,000. That liability does not show up anywhere in your financial statements. We're just required to disclose that to you. You know, we all know Capers is in shortfall. If they decided to stop tomorrow, they would be short of being able to pay all the retirees that are in the system. And your portion of that shortage has been calculated out to be $4,057,000. Now, I'll back that up and say, if you were doing gap financial statements, that really is the city's liability. It did show up as a liability in your financial statements. But since we're doing the cash basis financial statements, that number's just disclosed to you to say that, that your portion of that shortfall is $4 million. I don't believe we'll ever have to pay that as a city, but we're required to disclose that number to you. <clears throat> bottom of the page is capital uh, projects. Actually goes on the bottom of the page and continues on the next one. Uh, these are all those projects that are individually authorized. And so each one has got the authorization and how much you had spent as of December 31st and then out there to the last column's got a completed date or a, a, a estimated completion date. Like the very top one is a CDBG, CDBG project. It was the curb ramps. You as a, 
as you approved $800,000 for that project, but you can see it came in at $777,000. So you were under the authorized amount. And again, just like the budget thing that we talked about a while ago, if any of those amounts were over the authorization, it would be noted as a state as a violation to Kansas statute because you're limited to how much you've authorized before you can make those payments. As you glance down through there, you're going to see that the fact that you were under the authorized amount on all of those projects. Footnote number 11 talks about your vacation policy and the fact that you do have a liability out there at your end that doesn't show up in the front financial statements. It's for your employees that have earned time but not yet taken it. The top of page 19 is risk management. How do you handle risk? Most cities do that through the purchase of insurance policies. And then we also disclose the workers' compensation. You are participating in the state pool on that. Interfund transfers, you glance down through there. All of those have a statutory number beside them, meaning all your transfers you made last year were authorized under Kansas statute. And then the last footnote there on page 19 is subsequent events in which we talk about the fact that you did have a KDHE loan of $3.1 million. Uh, after year end, and so we just just disclose that material event there. The rest of this will go pretty quick, and then we'll come back to those letters. Page 20 is schedule number one. The Kansas Municipal Audit and Accounting Guide, KMAG, says this statement is to show users at a glance that you're in compliance with the budget laws of the state of Kansas, so that public approval piece. As you glance down through there, if any of those, or actually I don't like it that much because negative is good. <laughs> that means you're under budget. So as you glance down through there, a negative is good, meaning you are under the budgeted amount in all the funds, except for you can see the general fund in which we talked about that just a little while ago. We did go over our approved budget in the general fund. The rest of the booklet, I'm not going to go page by page, but this is laid out in the same format as your state budget. Like the very top line of the general fund, ad valorem taxes, that's your property taxes. In 2017, you collected $1.4 million in property taxes. The budget was actually how much you levied. You'd actually levied $1,562,000. So that $158,000 that's in that last column of under budget, that's $158,000. That's your taxpayers that didn't pay their tax bill in 2017. So the hope is, is the next line down is delinquent taxes, is the monies that were not paid in 17 will come in in the next year as delinquent property tax payments. Again, this follows the state format. I'm not going to go line by line like we, like I said. It lists out all the different revenues and the expenses by the different budget categories and in the different line items. General funds there, it's one, two, three, four pages long. I'm going to have you come back to these letters that are in here unless you have specific <laughs> questions about individual funds. And actually, if, after we get done with this meeting, if you decide you have a, a question tomorrow, uh, Mike's been very helpful in making sure that he knows where the numbers came from, and he should be able to answer your question. But if not, you could always call or email me uh, to, to help answer a question of, that you would have. There's two letters that were in your packets. Uh, I guess let's, there's one with a date at the top and one that doesn't. The one with the date, let's talk about it real quick. This is what they call the presentation letter, in which in the past, if we had any problems during the audit, we would be required to come to you orally and talk to you about it. Or now required, as legals got involved with everything, we got to put it in writing to talk about how management cooperated with us difficulties we had, any adjustments we had. Uh, I'm kind of making light of this letter because it's in your packets only. This letter doesn't go out to the public. It doesn't go to our grantors, to our funders. But as you read through this letter, it talks about the fact that we didn't have to consult any outside accountants because you're doing something crazy with your books. It's a boilerplate letter, but it's important that you do read through it. 
the starting on the third page of that letter is the adjustments of where the numbers were when you last seen them to how they show up in the little blue book. Then the very last section of that is what they call the management representation letter, in which it used to be signed between the auditors and management. Uh, we're now required to disclose that to you so you can see it. I always call it the reminder letter because as management reads through it before they sign that, they should have talked to the auditor about everything that was applicable in it, meaning they're reading that paragraph that says there was no fraud during the last year. If there was, they should have talked to me. But when they read that paragraph and before they sign, they think, yeah, I didn't have any fraud, so we didn't need to talk to the auditor about that. There's a paragraph about lawsuits. So did you talk to me about all the lawsuits that are out there? Conflicts of interest, laws and regulations, grant agreements. There's a big long list there. That is a boilerplate letter because we didn't have any of those type of situations that arose. But we are required to disclose that so you can see what disclosures and representations have been made between the auditor and management. The other letter that's in there, uh, a lot of people refer to it as the management letter. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that. It's called like a SAS 116 communications with those charged with governance letter. Uh, we talk about internal controls in this letter, uh, things that we could see uh, and need improvement uh, with the city with internal controls. And, uh, you know, as, as we came in as your auditor, you just got your last year's audit and you had some items that came to like there. And so as, we're re as we go through these, some of these are going to be repeat because, you know, we didn't come in till so late. Uh, management went through most of the year without fixing those situations because they weren't pointed out until most of the year was already taken care of with that 17. Like the very first item there, the, the heading that's got an underline on it is bank reconciliations. Uh, management uh, was not keeping current on bank reconciliations. Uh, bank reconciliations are a very important internal control. Uh, that's where fraud would happen is with cash. Uh, it's important that it's looked at, signed off on, and done in a timely manner so that you can watch what's happening with your cash account. Uh, we just make a recommendation that we feel like timely uh, reconciliations are important. Uh, when we were here, uh, we ended up leaving before we were done with the audit because the bank reconciliations weren't done. We left it with management. Uh, David was new at the time uh, when he came in. He worked with Ma Mike and David, worked together, and got the bank reconciled for the audit. And we got those numbers in. Uh, we made recon I mean, we've made adjustments to get these numbers to uh, coincide with those bank reconciliations. And then management has brought those up. Uh, we had an exit conference just the other day. Uh, do you want to address this? Sure. Bank sure. reconciliations, I was told, was caught up, but I'll yeah. let him. We, we are caught up. We're caught up through all of 2018 and uh, just as of yesterday we have completed November so we've got one month left to do uh, we'll complete December and everything's on track and uh, we'll, we'll stay the course on that which that's that's really good news I mean because before we are a year behind we're you know within the first few days of the new month the banks are reconciled now I have not tested that so I can't attest to it but uh, management's told you that. In fact, they're already talking about trying to figure out how to schedule the audit in April of May or April or May of next year, so that we can get in here and get you your numbers sooner. Uh, we do 30. I said 32 earlier. It's 36 audits now of cities, in which we have almost every one of them done before your budget process, so that you can use your numbers that are in the audit for the budget process. So that's going to be our goal for next year for you as a city is that we can have bank reconciliations caught up and your books in order so that we can get your audit in time for you to have your budget to prepare. So I think that's good news in a way. We talk about accounts payable to that bottom of that page. Uh, we talk about Kansas cash basis. It's <clears throat> cash receipts plus expenditures. Expenditures are cash disbursements plus encumbrances. That's any obligations and accounts payable. So any obligations that have been made by the city. In the past, your books were not in the process or ability 
to record accounts payable and to get those obligations put back to the proper budget period. Uh, we made really good headway when we were here for audit. Uh, management, actually, we hooked them up with another city in which they went and got training. I've been told by the other city manager, so I'm, I know that that training has happened. Uh, they've been working on getting training so that accounts payable can be taken a, into account. You know, you can't end a year and not know that all your expenses are in there because you have to have all expenditures and they got to be in the right budget period when it comes down to the end. And we talk about the fact that it is required by statute that you do that because it's part of the Kansas cash basis and budget laws. And so in that case, I think Mike can attest that the the training is going on and it will happen in the future. Questions? The next page talks about the publication of treasurer's reports. You know, we talked about that statute just a little while ago. We do point out it is required by state statute to publish within 30 days after the end of each quarter. Uh, we just, we're saying we really recommend that you do that. You follow Kansas statute. Credit cards and charge accounts. Uh, when we were doing your testing of credit cards, uh, we found some uh, charges that didn't contain adequate supporting documentation. Uh, we're not saying that they weren't legitimate business expenses. They may have appeared to be legitimate business expenses, meaning we're going to a conference or we're doing things that we needed to do, but they didn't include the original invoice with it. We feel like it's important with a credit card that you get the supporting documentation behind it. All disbursements of the city have to have a written claim against the city to be paid. That's Kansas statute. In our opinion, a statement is not a written claim against the city. The individual invoices to back up those charges on that credit card are the written claim against the city. So it's important that we're keeping all of those. It also, by keeping those receipts, if there was something that was on the line of whether it was personal use or whether it was city, bringing the receipt in with some documentation behind why we bought something is really going to stop or curb any accusations out there of personal expenses with a city credit card. So it's important that we're turning in those, those invoices. You know, I have something. Yes. And just to let you know on this, after conferring with Neil on this, uh, that coming to light that we had a few instances where that was occurring, we've went ahead and put in some extra layers of security and procedures that has to be uh, performed before the credit cards can be checked out. And I'll ensure that we're getting those receipts back in. The next one talks about utility b uh, billing rates. Uh, when we came in and we're testing, we picked customer charges. Uh, we picked some utility bills and we verify that they're properly being charged, that we really got it collected, uh, make sure that it got posted correctly. Uh, we found some uh, instances where the ordinance in which you passed did not ma match what was set up in the accounting software. And I believe you're going to address that later in this meeting is you're going to look at those. But I was told by staff that there's a there's an issue because of the way it's done here and the software applies a percentage. It's a rounding issue, but they still don't match. So my uh, my solution when I was here is like, okay, well, if if you can't make the system match what the commissioners say, then you need to get the commissioners to pass what you say. You know, they can give you your wishes as I want this percentage of increase, but then that's the ch the table or the chart that needs to be brought back to be approved. Uh, in all instances, I don't believe that you're going to find that there's, you know, we don't owe any utility customers thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars. Uh, they were all small dollar amounts. And the one chart we did, the the worst was the sanitation and yeah, which sanitation on actually yeah the yeah the first yeah the dumpsters and so i think it'll get taken care of and it, i don't believe that it's an instance where we need to go back and we've got a refunds or we need to charge the city people you know our customers more money because we were undercharging them i think it's just a matter of let's get all this in line so that we can go forward with the two things matching Journal entry procedures. 
Uh, talk about journal entries. Uh, a journal entry uh, is a means of overriding a control. Uh, you go. Th I always explain it as a bill goes through a whole rainbow process of approvals and signatures to make it to one line item in your financial statements. Well, when you do a journal entry to move it from that line down to this line, you break that rainbow of controls that are in place. Meaning we no longer, every, all the approvals and everybody signing off on it before that point, it's null and void once we move it. Well, journal entries need to have two people signing off on them so that we know what's going on. Because we want that internal control there. A lot of times fraud is perpetrated by not having somebody else involved in a journal entry process because it breaks that cycle of controls. And we want to keep all our expenses and all our revenues in internal controls to keep them in the right place and they're in accurate. We need two people signing off on journal entries. We feel it's an important step. Payroll is the next item that we talk about. Uh, during our testing of payroll, uh, we found some bonus checks that were issued last year. Uh, bonuses are cash. Cash to an employee is wages. Let's step that back a little bit further before I say cash is, you know, gift cards are considered cash. City bucks are considered <coughs> cash according to the IRS. <coughs> So if you give any gift of more than $25 to an employee, we got to make sure it gets added to their W-2 properly. Uh, I give the example of my employees all get $100 Christmas. They get $100 of, of Chanute bucks in their Christmas card. They just got them today, by the way. But if they watch their next check, their gross salary went up by $111, which netted out to $100 of cash, but it got added to their W-2. They may have got it in cash. Well, in this case, they got schnoot bucks, but they still have to add it to their W-2. So, so a, a gift is, is, uh, has a value. A gift isn't a free item. It does have give. value. Right. Uh, that applies. They, the IRS calls, de, calls it de minimis, <clears throat> and they've set a level of $25 for de minimis. And so we're not supposed to be handing out anything more than $25 to an employee without some proper accounting and adding it to their W-2. Does that include a, a product or something like a turkey or that has a, yeah, it has we, a value? We can't give them no $50 turkey. Yeah, yeah. If we're just going down to the local grocery store and buying turkeys, then that would qualify as under the $25, in my opinion. Uh, I, I, I've not a turkey for a while. I, I hope that. <laughs> I may be speaking out of turn here. I think they were under a dollar a pound when uh, last I seen. Uh, yeah. But you know. So gifts have value, basically. No yes. matter if it's over twenty-five dollars. It... Yes, sir. Okay. That is a true statement. Just got to be added the W two, <clears throat> and your employee ends up paying the income tax on it. <laughs> you know, and that that goes the same for any allowances like a. Uh, a clothing allowance that you give an employee or uh, anything that you give an employee, they're going to end up paying the income tax on it is what it comes down to. Um, I had uh, We have a city that uh, they were giving suits uh, to their detectives. They were buying the suit, and we were telling them they had to add it to the W-2s, and the detective said, well, I just don't want the suit. I said, well, wait a minute. You're only having to pay. You're in a 15% tax bracket. And five for the state, fifteen for there. That's twenty percent. So they're buying you a two hundred dollar suit, and you're paying forty dollars for it. Mm. That's quite the. That's quite a fringe, but it does. Inc it is supposed to be included on the W two. And it's an accumulation over the year, not a just one time. I've never. That would be. That would be uh, cutting some hairs. <laughs> uh, it. I. It's any gift over twenty five dollars is what the rule says. Mm. If you split it between 20 gifts of 24.99, I don't know. You know, I'm not a lawyer to tell you one way or the other. I'm the, the rule says $25, yeah. it, a $25 a, gift. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. uh, bottom of the page, we talk about your 941s. That's the <laughs> quarterly reporting of payroll. Uh, your quarterly reporting of payroll reports your wages and the withholdings that have been out of the employee's checks. Uh, when you send in your W-3, 
which that's the summary of all your W-2s. It comes up and put, puts a total on the front page, makes it easy for the IRS and Department of uh, Labor. That gets mailed in. Your four quarters of 941s will be added up by the Department of Labor to make sure that they match what you told the IRS. And in your case, when you add up the four quarters of 941s, they don't equal the W-3, which will take usually a couple years to catch. Department of Labor is a little slower in getting that information from, it used to be five to ten years before you'd get caught. It's getting a little faster with computers, but it does take a little while. But the Department of Labor will eventually notice that your W-3 did not match your 941s and will send you a notice with penalties and interest. We think that you should go back and analyze that and figure out what we need to amend. Do we need to amend 941s? Do we need to amend W-2s? What instance do we need to, to amend? In your case, it was a very small dollar it amount. Was. It, it was, and uh, we, we have determined that dollar amount. It was 200 and less than $230. Uh, Brenda is in the process. We were hoping we'd have that finished up today. Uh, but uh, she's in the process of determining the exact where the breakdown was on that. We will get that fixed and uh, and completed before the end of the year. Yeah, the problem the problem is it's only two hundred and thirty dollars. But when you start adding penalties and interest on that over time, the IRS doesn't charge you three percent interest like a bank or something. It's a uh, like eighteen percent a month or something. It's something <laughs> crazy. But it's important that you do get it fixed because that will build up to be a bigger dollar amount. We recommend that you go ahead and take care of it now. There was a lot of information to take in. <clears throat> Truthfully, I think you have some processes in place. Uh, like I said, I have not audited 18, but uh, with discussions with management and the things that we've seen uh, happening, the training that's going on, uh, you know, the bank reconciliations being done quite timely, that's, that's awesome. I mean, I haven't reviewed them to know that for sure, but with management telling me they're already done, that should be exciting news to you that you've got processes in place where the majority of this stuff is going to get fixed where it's not going to be a problem in the future. Your biggest issue right here is your last report didn't come till so late that all of 17 involved quite a few problems because it was 16 problems that continued on over into 17. 18's where you really got to dig in and start fixing them. 18's where your audit will turn around and, and shine. You mentioned credit cards. I just would like a little clarification on that. If, I don't know, a police officer in Tulsa and has to put gasoline in his vehicle, he just has to document that? I document mean, it, get a copy of the receipt. You know, the pumps will give you receipts. <laughs> uh, if, if that receipt didn't come out of the pump, there could be a, I mean, you should have a process in house just so he could document it when he got back, that he got gas at such and such, and, and document why. Uh, the other biggest one is restaurants. A lot of times an employee will walk out without an invoice, you know, bringing that original receipt back from the restaurant. Uh, it's important that you have that documentation. A federal auditor will disallow every single food item that doesn't have detail behind it because they say that you have to prove there was no alcohol on that ticket on a federal audit. That's a federal audit, not a, a local audit or a, even a state audit. Uh, but you've got to remember, bring that detail back. That also keeps everybody honest, keeps everybody to know what they can and can't charge in the end. And you order something online, you're always going to get an email confirmation or even just print screen while you're sitting there. That way you have something to, put, to document what you were buying and why you were buying. Or you go down, you know, I know Craig could go down and, and maybe somebody's coming to town for economic development. He takes them to lunch downtown. Uh, he should get a receipt behind what he bought. And on that receipt, write down economic development meeting so that we know he wasn't just eating out downtown on the company's, right. company's bill. Yeah. But if he has the detail, that at least tells me, one, he knows that he was turning something in. 
best practices to go ahead and write on it. Sometimes they don't, you know, not everybody writes on it, but at least if we have the receipt, that's one step closer to saying, yeah, it was a legitimate business expense because if you're really trying to cheat the city out of money, the best thing to do is just not turn in the receipt, right? So important that we do to keep those receipts. But you said specifically we identified some charges on the credit card which did not contain adequate supporting documentation. Yes, sir. Is that common in other cities? Are we not doing uh, as good as other cities, or is that something that a lot of cities struggle to always keep those? Some of the bigger cities do struggle, uh, but it is an important step. Yeah, uh, the, best, uh, the best uh, policy that I've seen put in place is to tell your employees that they're going to have to pay for it if they don't turn in a receipt. And the first time that you charge an employee for that meal because they forgot to turn in a receipt, That'll make it through the rest of the staff really quickly, and everybody's going to turn in that receipt. Uh, really, the policy should be we won't reimburse you if you aren't going to bring back the receipt. Fair enough. Yeah. Seems reasonable. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to wait just a minute. Mike asked me to hang around. That's why we moved those agenda <laughs> items around for the first two agenda items, so I could answer any questions that you had. So. Uh, I had some questions, but I think it probably deals not with what you did. It was some information in there. I'll just send them to, to Craig and Kelly and they can get the answers. But I think uh, now there were a couple, excuse me. In the past, the Housing Authority audit had been included yes, sir. in this. And, I and, noticed, and the library. Yes. And yes, I sir. noticed that you removed those from the city and it stated that they are provided separately They're to going, that entity? Yes. Uh, the Kansas Municipal Audit and Accounting Guide requires any entity with more than $250,000 receipts, well, it was two hundred fifty. dollars that number has increased, to have a separate audit be submitted to the state. Now, I can't answer for past auditors or past accountants or past people, but uh, we're going to follow the rule, and they're going to get a separate audit, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, so I did not want to include them in here. We prepared a separate audit in which you were able to then submit to the state to follow statute with re the requirement that they have a separate audit. So on, on those, I guess not as much with the library, but in the past we had been handling all the expenses for the housing authority. You are, so, you are still the fiscal person for the authority. You're still writing the majority of their checks and recording those revenues. And we do take that into account when we're doing the audit for them. Uh, but we more feel that you're the fiscal agent for the housing authority because they have their own separate board and they are making their own separate decisions. Uh, their expenses do come through you on a monthly basis so you can approve them. Uh, but their board has ultimate responsibility for those expenses. So for, for our audit, it's more of an in and out. Yes. A receipt from the housing authority and an even though there are various receipts and various expenses, it, our concern is just that one number of what comes in to respond to it and how mm -hmm. much goes out and provide that information. Then the separate audit that it's conducted of actual how all that's used. Yes. That's not our... And they actually have separate <laughs> bank accounts. And so, like, when that money comes in, it gets deposited into their accounts, not into your accounts. So they have their own federal ID numbers, their own, their own, their own cash in bank is their own money. You literally have been just doing the accounting for them. So we're writing checks from separate accounts, not city accounts? Well, we'll write them from the city accounts and then they'll write us a check to reimburse us. I understand. Yeah. Okay. We run it through our process because it's easier. Then those expenses get reimbursed. Okay. Then, um, the statement maybe uh, is a little confusing on page five um, about the housing authority can sue and can be sued and can buy, sell, or lease real estate. By state statute, they are their own board and they can do that. Uh, now they would the check would still go through the city commission because you're writing their checks for them, mm -hmm. but they could make the decision to go buy. Uh, anything they wanted to with their with their money in their checking accounts basically they are a separate board and they're a separate living entity 
And then do their purchases have to be approved by the city? No, they would not have to be. The reason they are now is because they're ran through your general process. Well, then does statute authorize them to own property? Uh, yes, they can own property. I think what you're missing, and maybe he doesn't know, is when the city commission set up the housing authority back in the 60s or 70s, whatever it was, they precluded our, our housing authority from owning real estate. So anytime the housing authority funds are used to buy real estate, it's in the name of the city. I think that's, that's what I, yeah. Maybe that's what but that was done by our local <clears throat> city commission. Okay. Even though state statute would authorize them to, them own to it. do it. So you, ours, you have as a commission prohibited it. Uh, yeah, previous, uh -huh. many years ago. Yeah. Okay. That, that's what I was wondering because, you know, in, in the statement of the, the audit, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I saw different that than what we had and I'm, I should have got I just was able to look at it today so okay uh, we, we can make that change for the future I think it I think that's important that we make that yeah. change for the future can you I was not informed of that I, I apologize well no that's for how do you handle that statement then in this audit do you issue a, an a, attachment Clarifying if because you felt, if you felt like it was a material statement that needed to be clarified, we could we could make those changes. Well, um, you know, <clears throat> I think just for information for the public to be correct, so that you know somebody reads this and then they say, well, well, why is all this property in the city's name if the housing authority? And it, it would just be another. I don't want to say contention, but a, a problem that it, if we had a letter modifying this, then it would solve everyone. I think a lot of questions right. that come up. Right. That's not a problem. We can fix it. Yeah. Thank you. That was, I think, the only question I had relating to, okay. to the audit. And we got, with the letters, of course, I'd like to go through them, and then if we have questions, get back with those. We're, mm -hmm. you know, just receiving them tonight, and, and I know you're you're asking for a signature. Um, I believe that I that's would our, like to. I think that's already been taken care of. The representation letter. Did you already send that to me? No. Okay. It's not. Okay. Well, I won't sign it until I read it. Sorry, okay. I wouldn't expect you to. <laughs> Please <Okay>. don't. <laughs> I think your legal counsel will tell you the yeah. same thing. Don't sign it unless you read it. <laughs> right. Okay. Do you uh, have any other questions about the audit? Do you have any? Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, I don't know, maybe since we modified the, the order of the agenda, Let's look at item item E. Um, consider authorizing cash bonuses in lieu of annual holiday gift certificates for the employees. Um, I think you explained pretty much the the process of what happened and why we have to to go this route. Um, in in our RCA mentioned that. Um, or the suggestion for the commission was to consider instead of $50 per employee, we would uh, make the bonus $75, so that would include their Cover the taxation, taxes. Cover the yes. Um, the, only, the only question, it, it was kind of unclear where we're giving the housing authority and the library their bonus, it, it said, well, you know, we're not responsible for their taxes. It's kind of up to them. So then in that case, you know, I would hate to give them where they get more than our city employees. If they, they will be handling their own bonus, whatever protocol they, they want to follow for the bonuses. This, this would just only be for the city employees. So we're not giving the housing authority? Or, nor the library. None. None. Zero. Zero. They, okay. they will. They will handle it themselves. Okay. Because that. I. I guess when I. 
I read it, it still read like we were going to give the $75 across the board. But yeah, I, I the, think maybe initially, and, and I didn't catch that before the RCA went out, but uh, okay. the decision was made, of course, on the library, we don't do their payroll, so therefore right. we couldn't do that for them. Right. Um, and then secondly, with the, the housing authority, uh, that they have determined that they're just going to handle it however they choose to do it, but okay. it won't be through the payroll. So then when we look at a motion, it will be reflected only to city the city employees. of independence employees. Absolutely. Okay. And I heard Neil say we could still do the gift certificates. There's no nothing well, saying we can't do that. Yeah, there, there's nothing to preclude us from doing that. However, because this is such a new revelation uh, and examining our, our payroll system, mm -hmm. we're not real sure how to accomplish that. Yeah, uh, getting that in there without actually right. having a cash yeah. cash in there. Right. Uh, so we will look at it, but the timing was such uh, that we felt like this was the, the best and easiest way to move forward with it. Yeah, so that it shows up on all your... That's right. And so it'll, it'll just be part of their check, and, yeah. and they can uh, use it as, as they would the Main Street Bucks. Okay. So it would just be included in their payroll check and increase... That's correct. Basically, a $75 yeah. in the applicable taxes will come. Okay. Do you have any questions? No, that, that answers it. Any right further there. questions? No, sir. Okay, if we have no further questions, then I'll entertain a motion. I move that we authorize $75 cash, cash bonuses in lieu of uh, the annual holiday gift certificates for city employees. Do you have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Now, item A, um, consider adopting ordinance modifying water, sewer, and sanitation rates was... There's a little story behind all three of them. Of course, we went over the sanitation rates tonight and why we're bringing that to you to get the two <laughs> systems aligned the, between the ordinances and the fee schedule within that ordinance and then back within our system. Uh, we, we were unaware of some of the limitations uh, that we experienced in the system. We're aware of those now, so we're, we're aligning those and we can make sure that there are uh, uh, any future changes uh, with increases uh, would be reflected correctly. Uh, but we are reflecting them correctly now in, the, in this change. The water rates and the sewer rates, uh, this, this is not a, as a result of anything from the audit. Uh, back this summer when we approved the 2019 budget, we had programmed a 6.5% increase uh, for 2019 when we approved the water rates back in 2017. Uh, through agreement of the commissioners, we reduced that increase for 2019 on the water rates from 6.5% down to 6%. So in order to do that, uh, we are updating the fee schedule to reflect, reflect that change, at the 6% increase as opposed to 6.5%. On the sewer rates, uh, we are adding that in there as an amendment because of our agreement with the uh, Montgomery County Rural Sewer District. Uh, as we took over those services in the fall, or no, I guess it was the spring of 2018, uh, the agreement called for them to have their own rate structure that was different from inside the city limit rates, but also different from the sewer district rates. So all this is doing, we are charging our customers the, the correct rate. We just didn't have a fee fee schedule established for that outside city limit rate for the, for the sewer customers. Any questions? Questions? No. There's no questions, and I'll entertain a motion. I move to adopt ordinances modifying water, sewer, and sanitation rates as proposed. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion opposed? Or motion. Those opposed? Motion carried. Thank you for the. <coughs> help on both of those in the presentation yeah thank you Neil yes I'm gonna stand up for a second but don't don't slow down okay <clears throat> next item on the agenda consider modifying 
recommendation from the Planning Commission to adopt an ordinance implementing tax amendments to the Code of the City of Independence, Kansas, specifically Appendix B, Zoning Code relating to off-street parking requirements. <clears throat> a matter of background, we have um, a timeline up here of, of kind of where this started. On uh, July 2nd, they, the Planning Commission held a hearing. Um, then they uh, adjourned that hearing to October 2nd. They brought some, brought some recommendations back um, to you guys on November 5th, and you guys provided some feedback. And we took that back to their meeting on December 4th, and, and they have responded to that. I do have one Planning Commissioner present, Michelle Anderson, who is here on the Planning Commission. I'd like to recognize her. I don't, Steve said he was coming, but I don't see him. So, so um, some of the feedback from the uh, your previous meeting <coughs> that you wanted um, what had to do with the uh, initial intent and purpose and if it would attract businesses and in the yellow I have the response from the Planning Commission which the response was to make the city more attractive to recruit new businesses to the city and to enable flexibility for existing businesses to expand their parking area if need be for growth in alignment with the economic development strategic directive number one of the community-based strategic plan and then the next section was uh, concerns on the appearance of large gravel parking lots, gravel running off in heavy rains, and the ability to adequately mark ADA spots. And the Planning Commission's response to that was uh, non-ADA off-street parking areas shall be graded, paved, or otherwise improved with an all-weather dustless material that is contained in such a manner as to not allow surface material to wash off during heavy rains and so drained as to vo void flow of water across sidewalks. ADA compliant parking and accessible paths to an entrance to the facility served by off street parking shall be hard surface. And that was a modification also. And then uh, some of the feedback um, regarding <laughs> the limiting the size of gravel parking lots to a maximum number of spaces and uh, to continue to require new buildings or new industries to hard surface required off street parking to city code standards but allow existing industries that already have a gravel parking lot that is grandfathered in for non-conforming use to expand or enlarge their existing gravel parking lot however if they have an existing hard surface parking lot any expansion and enlargement would have to be hard surface and the response from the Planning Commission on that was they unanimously approved a motion to not limit the size of non-hard surface parking lots to a maximum number of spaces, nor require new businesses or industries to hard surface or business expansions to hard surface. The exceptions would be if the business has an existing hard surface parking area, they cannot remove it and replace it with a hard surface material, um, a non-hard surface material, sorry about that. If a business expands an existing hard surface parking area, they may do so with non-hard surface material for a period of up to two years. After that, the expanded parking area must be removed or hard surface. And they were thinking about that, like if the business had some, you know, like the refinery does a turnaround and they have a temporary parking area, they wanted to allow somebody needed a temporary parking area for a short period of time, which was kind of the, the thing behind that. And then going through what's actually um, been modified, I kind of color coded it because it gets a little confusing. Um, and actually, the modifications are the green. I don't know if you can see the green up there. And um, based on what was originally recommended, they took out the gravel definition because they didn't want to use um, gravel as a def definition. So they modified that because you could have other things that aren't necessarily hard surface that are maybe made out of recycled tires or I mean there's other things that they they're using nowadays so they were they took out the reference to gravel so that was the main thing on the the definitions they left the ADA definition in because that was not in our, our our zoning code and needed to be added in and then on the next one on the design requirements is um, basically and I'd read back uh, some of this previously as well. They modified what they originally recommended on that and um, on the exceptions. And what they changed is in M1 and M2 districts, other material may be substituted in lieu of concrete, asphalt concrete, or dub asphalt double sealed concrete. 
street surfaces, for non-ADA off-street parking spaces, for new parking areas and expansion of non-hard surface parking areas that are grandfathered in. If a business currently has a hard surface parking lot and needs to expand that parking area, they can expand it using a non-hard surface parking material for up to two years, at which time they will need to hard surface the expanded parking area, meeting the surface material requirements of 705.1, or remove the expanded parking area. The exceptions only apply to new or expanded parking areas and do not allow for the removal and replacement of existing concrete, asphalt concrete, or asphalt double sealed surfaces with other material. The exceptions shall meet the following requirements. Non-ADA off-street parking areas shall be graded, paved, or otherwise improved with an all-weather dustless material that is contained in such a manner as to not allow surface material to wash off during heavy rains and so drained as a vo void flow of water across sidewalks. ADA compliant parking and accessible paths to an entrance to the facility served by off-street parking shall be hard surface. So that was the modifications on the uh, surface material. <coughs> on the surface drives, originally they were going to allow those to be gravel or non-hard surface. They, did, they talked about that. Well, in fact, we had an hour and a half meeting. There was a lot of discussion. Well. Um, and they decided that they thought that transition between the street and the, the other parking area, they, they wanted that to, to remain hard surface, so they basically took out what they had recommended previously. Uh, relating to the, the size of the ADA spaces, that's the same as what was recommended previously. They did not modify that. And then on the striping required, um, basically it's, it's the same. The only thing they changed is they took the reference out on the gravel. And ADA accessibility that was uh, previously recommended is the same. They did not make a modification on that section. So your new ordinance reflects those modifications. I think the feedback from the commission was good. It <coughs> invoked a lot of, of discussion. And I know Michelle's here, and if, uh, you know, I'm sure she'd be happy to chime in on this. <laughs> it was a long night for her, too, as well. And uh, we had uh, seven out of nine of our commissioners present. And um, I, I mean, I think the Planning Commission really appreciates the feedback from the commission, and and uh, this is what they came up with. So, an all-weather dustless material. It, does that include gravel? It could include gravel if it's treated in such a way that it contains the dust. And actually, we got that from Coffeeville. That's what Coffeeville uses. They can have uh, gravel parking lots as long as they're treated with the chemical or whatever that keeps the dust uh, from being a problem. And actually, I talked to them, and actually, that's where some of that came from. Is, is that's what they do? That's something that they had. Uh, what is the chemical? Do you know? Is it calcium? I don't know. Mike's here. He might know the name of the chemical because I think we treated some of our roads with it before what is it so <clears throat> I, s I see the uh, the opening it to an acceptable parking lot of gravel being being a problem you know when you look at it, a new industry coming in uh, such as Walmart, that magnitude, or even... Um, it would count for that, though, because that's not an industrial zone. So your retail, restaurants, things like that, that are in a commercial got zone. To. Yeah, but that's not changes. This is just hmm. in the M1 and N2 zones, just the industrial zones. The only thing that would be an exception to that is that old thing that's been in there for a long time about the vehicles under one ownership, and I'm not really quite sure why that was. The only thing I could think of is maybe mm -hmm. like Sheldon's lot, you know, he oh, vehicles yeah. under one ownership <clears throat> do not yeah. have to um, meet the the requirements of the hard servicing. I don't I'm sure there's a story behind that, but it's before mm -hmm. my time. Yeah. So I do not know what that was. But it is still there, but we did make some modifications so that even that one would have to meet this, you know, making sure the gravel is contained and the service drives still have to be hard service. So we kinda made the exceptions apply to any mm -hmm. non-hard sur surface um, parking area. Yeah. See, when you open up the gravel, and even with the calcium chloride, 
it depends upon the traffic because the mm -hmm. gravel still rotates and moves and as it does that mm -hmm. it loosens the, the the fines and even rain and mm -hmm. the deterioration and then the problems that we have in our spaces associating maintenance from the moving gravel and then mm -hmm. the enforcement of uh, mm -hmm. making sure it continually sprayed i think the county does theirs like annually but i don't you know i don't know if it should be done more often than that's like you said it's going to depend on the traffic yeah and it and usually the county does it just in well the bypass mm -hmm. the, there's one county road when peter pan was closed mm -hmm. so would that be something we'd want to consider about how to uh, go back and retreat that gravel for the city to treat no it? not for the city for you the, mean for the for well the, it would be up to them to meet that dustless thing so if it became an issue um and somebody complained we just have to let them know and they'd have to go treat it again um it's up to them to determine no how to make it dustless it could mm -hmm. be a different material that they use that maybe it's less dust prone too we tried not to like i said limit it because there's other materials that people are using with all the recycling and things that are that may not be gravel it could be something else yeah, we don't want to in, increase our burden of enforcement you know, a hard surface dr drive or parking is mm -hmm. pretty apparent there's no judgment in it like i i can see the the need to address an existing gravel parking lot at a business that's going to uh, add a few more positions to not require them to go to an existing gravel lot and have to hard surface it but looking at, at new businesses uh, it's just a little different with with the dust and maintenance and we don't want to increase our problems i know that the alleys that we have that are still gravel and streets mm -hmm. and the rains it's a continuing washing problem out onto the pavement well and then we do you know the <coughs> county has that gravel parking lot but it's mm -hmm. actually in a residential zone and their yeah. conditional use permit that was extended in the end of this year um so if this for instance had went through then um, if they had that rezone, then they could potentially meet it if they, as long as they did mm -hmm. their service drives and things in and treated it so it wasn't mm -hmm. an issue. So, you know, it would resolve that issue because mm -hmm. currently at the end of the year, then, then they're supposed to have that hard surfaced. Right. Questions? The tough one. It is. Uh, I certainly want to do anything we can to encourage new industry but on my block, there's only my family and my next door neighbor that use our alley. And it's, you know, it's gravel and it's, I mean, it's bad. You know, it, yeah. even it, it, if it gets bladed and it looks really good, a couple months later it looks bad again. And that's not really carrying much traffic at all. So I, you know, I like the way they say this, shall be graded, paved, or otherwise improved with all weather, dust and material that's contained. So it's not to allow surface material to wash after in heavy rains. I just don't know how you do all that. I'm, I'm not a gravel expert, but it, it, this makes it sound like it's doable, but I don't, I don't know how. Or is this just wishful thinking? Well, like I said, we borrowed some of it from Coffeeville, and they yeah. said that the ones that have the gravel lots over there um, treat it. And, and it hasn't been a problem for them. They're pleased with it the way they do it. Well, um, yeah, I talked to one of their employees that... Um, and so he didn't indicate that they have problems with mm -hmm. them. And this is just in the M1 and M2 Yeah, that's just the industrial zones. Industrial zones. That's what Coffeeville does. <laughs> tempting. <coughs> really tempting. I see your gravel. <laughs> yeah, the... I just have a problem with the gravel in the long term you know it's it's going to be an issue it's going to cause us more enforcement 
more supervision, another chance of contention with property owners to make sure it's graded, to what level to maintain runoff on a soft lot, uh, that it drains the proper way and, and dust. And well, it's created some contention already because you have some illegal ones. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> but you have some also that were, have been grandfathered in that's been there for several years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the city facilities, facilities yeah. they have gravel lots yeah. and have for years. And if we pave it, we're making a much bigger water runoff issue. Yes, it's not as permeable. Right. Huge difference. Well, I don't know. They, um, More questions? A couple of the planning commissioners had talked to um, a company over in Chinoo called Horizon. And they said that they had talked to the plant manager. And part of the reason for locating there is because they didn't have to pay the lot. Now I don't, I didn't talk to them personally, but that was stated in the, in the meeting. Yeah, I'm sure it's very expensive. My yeah. new ADA ramp I just got the bill for today. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can't park very many cars on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Do we want to make a motion? Do I have a motion? There's no more discussion. I'll make a motion. Um, let's see. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I won't. <laughs> if you want to consider it, we can also table it to look and consider more. You know, I, I think it's a significant change and, you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a concept, but in the end, I question it being doable. Do you uh, maybe want to have a joint work session with the uh, Planning Commission and table it until then so you can talk directly to them? Is that a thought, possibly? Yeah, you're in I'd, favor. I'd, I'd be yeah, agreeable to that. I'd yes. To do that. Yeah, we just sit down and talk it out. Okay, so you can table that till I can get a date that right. everybody's available. <clears throat> Probably would be sometime in January. Would that be okay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's great. fine. Okay. Okay. Okay, the next item is consider a request from USD 446 to rezone tracts of land from R4 medium density multifamily dwelling district to M1 light industrial district on the east side of the 2200 block of North 22nd Street, tabled from the November 29th meeting. And Rusty Arnold is here representing the applicant. Um, okay. And if <clears throat> Have any questions of him? I'm sure he can answer those for you. Um, we presented on this last time, so I'm sure you don't want me to present it the same thing again. But if you do, I'd be happy to do that. Did you have a chance to go by and mm -hmm. look at it? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, I went by today too. Um, I guess might as well just jump in. Um, this is a difficult any time dealing with, with zoning. Uh, there's a lot of issues we need to consider when we look at rezoning a piece of property. Um, looking at the comprehensive plan that was developed, what at that time they saw of migration and development of the city, looking at uh, compatible uses. Um, when the areas are designated, they took into consideration the infrastructure and access to the site. Um, some of the things noted 
in our, our packet dealing with accessibility on it, arterial streets, um, the, the land use, there's some issues. You know, this is, for me, looking at, at the site, it's a difficult consideration. Um, when you look at straight land use, it, it's not compatible with the, the surrounding area. It's not associating itself with a, another light industrial zone. And when we look at long-term land use changes, we need to look at what all can go in there. Anything in the future that's acceptable to M1 zone can go in that, that site. Um, It doesn't associate with the other uh, M1 areas, which do provide easier access to arterial streets. I'm looking at the development of 21st Street, um, access for the increased traffic, uh, the heavier buses. The uh, another, you know, an issue dealing with the access to the site. The that access road is not a a street. And it, I guess it is city right away that the base isn't prepared that we incur uh, maintenance costs to that area. Um, without our, our drainage study looking at Whiskey Creek, how that is going to comply. Um, I did look at the topo. It, the site does break about midpoint, drainage to the south and drainage to the north. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe where the darker land is, that's about the break that goes south and the light color <coughs> drains north. Um, I guess to sum up what I'm saying is I don't think the M1 zone is compatible with the area when you look at just straight back relating to M1 zones and comprehensive plan and land use. Commissioners? You know, I looked at this property too and and I think since, since I've gotten uh, a late email here that this the size of the property that this that the, the school district was looking at has decreased in size um, but you know the concerns when I talked to some of the the neighbors in that area you know they were concerned about water runoff and and part of that water is going into the Whiskey Creek area I know there's going to be a water study done on this but we have issues from from the start to the finish of Whiskey Creek, and that we're just in the process of addressing what we're going to need to do from from the beginning to the end, and what we're going to uh, what's going to be feasible us for us to do money-wise to address some of these issues. And so we don't have a water study. So there's there's what's to say that's going to be the impact of if this project would go ahead, uh, what would be the impact of the water flow into the creek? Um, you know, and even though you're limited to just a certain amount of buses, um, you know, it is a narrow street. It's just a service service road. Um, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns um, associated with this that really aren't really aren't answered it's like you know go ahead and approve it and then we'll worry but then we'll look at the what the outcomes might potentially be after the after it's already done because we really don't have a definitive answers as to what this is is looking like and I understand they're they're you know they got buses on order and, and they need to come up with a solution for this I understand that too but there's other issues here in addition to that that 
that we need to consider and you know, we really need to look at everything in totality in making our decision. <laughs> How you doing? Doing okay. So you're looking at me, so I have an opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. I, I str I've struggled with this one a lot. I, um, I like what the school district is trying to do. They're trying to save the taxpayers a ton mm -hmm. of money, and uh, I sort of feel like any place they pick in the city for a bus bar, and the neighbors are not going to be very happy. And I'm, I'm sure the neighbors are not <coughs> happy with this. Um, I do think that we have seven brilliant school board members. I know they've looked at a lot of options. The Planning Commission says they're okay with it. We've told them they'll have to deal with the water, have the water study done and deal with water runoff. So I, you know, it, if I were choosing the location, this would not be the one I would pick. But I, I do think the school <coughs> board has outstanding uh, members and and they know a hell of a lot more than I do because they've looked at a lot of options. So I, I think I would probably be inclined to, to let them move forward mm -hmm. with it. But I certainly could be persuaded to go the other way. Yeah. yeah, I think that's where, you know, we've got, we've got multiple factors. We've got land use, we've got a need, and we've got another public entity that we're considering. We, when I looked at it, and, and that's what I, I struggled with the growth of the city and things like that, but a pure land use, um, the site isn't suited for M1. No. And, you know, you look then with uh, the traffic on 21st from the increased size of the vehicle, uh, the maintenance that we could incur, uh, that service drive um, the city establishing an appropriate base to build a street that complies with our street standards uh, it increases cost but you know when you when I looked at it as land use and as addressed with a comprehensive plan that was prepared to guide us into situations like this it's it's not, and I, I uh, looked up some spot zoning statements and sent those to Kelly because, you know, I was trying to look in the broad sense of how that would affect um, a decision and, and with spot zoning not being a law as such, but uh, a principle that there's a little more flexibility, but, you know, looking at, at the land use of an M1, that's what I came back to really purely is land use that is not an M1 site. There is a potential other option if you didn't have an issue <clears throat> with the bus barn, but you had an issue with the zoning, is you could modify the conditional and permitted use table and, and allow it as a conditional use in that zone, in which case you wouldn't have to rezone it you would provide a conditional use that would be specific to the bus barn and wouldn't allow another industry or something mm -hmm. to come in later. And that could be another alternative. And then, then with that, we look at the traffic, the runoff, and the yeah, infrastructure well we had, to it. Yeah, we had restrictions in the, um, you know, in the rezoning mm -hmm. recommendation as well. And you could have those same restrictions in a conditional mm -hmm. use permit. As it sets now, somebody could go in there and build multifamily apartments that could have even more increased um, issues with these things that you're talking about as well, which actually would yeah. not come back to the commission because it's already zoned for that. Yeah, but what when you, you look at Pheasant Point, the berm on the east side of 21st is really establishing their retention pond. Mm -hmm. You look at the size and the depth, it's quite significant. In development for multifamily, then the developer's responsible for developing the streets and parking areas according to our, our standard on site. So the hard surfacing, uh, the construction, the tie-ins to our infrastructure are at his expense, and the maintenance, you know, the vehicle traffic versus 
uh, larger capacity vehicles, uh, heavier vehicles. Well, and you could have that same kind of arrangement with the school with mm -hmm. their development as well. So it's just whatever you gentlemen would like to do. Yeah, at hand tonight is a consideration of rezoning the property to light industrial to a M1 zone. So, any more questions yeah. or comments? I appreciate the information because this was something that's very new to me and it actually opened my eyes a little bit about what we were looking at because it, it like I said, this is new to me. So I, I wouldn't, uh, there were some things that I hadn't considered when I, when I went out and I, and I talked to some of the people that lived uh, on 21st Street and, and they weren't, and they had some concerns and they just felt like, well, it's probably gonna go in. There's not anything we can do about it anyway. So they were one way or the other, they weren't <clears throat> upset or, or anything like that. But, but the concerns, you know, I'd, al I'd already mentioned that they had with the project and uh, and then when I got this information to give me a chance to go back and read this so it's it's just made this a lot tougher than what I thought it was going to be yeah it's not a it's not a an easy decision I spent a lot of time thinking and and trying to research to any other I, I, I would just remind you that it's not going to be popular anywhere it ends up probably. And, and, and as I understand it, when the apartments were proposed there, we had a huge outcry of people upset about no, that. wanting the apartments to go in, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. blight and right, so. a whole lot of other issues that, yeah. that were brought up as potential problems with that. And I certainly respect your opinion. So if there's no more discussion, I'll entertain a, a motion. I move that we approve the request from USD 446 to rezone tracts of land from R4, medium density multifamily dwelling district to M1, light industrial district on the east side of 2200 block of North 21st Street. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have no second. <laughs> you know, Do I have a second? No, I'm going to go back and base it on this information that you've given me here, Kelly, about it, it doesn't actually on the spot zoning. Oh, that was and that. provided by the mayor, actually. Oh, he asked okay, me to ask okay. It doesn't actually. Do we uh, want further apply. discussion? We have a motion. And no second. <clears throat> we have a motion and no second. Well, the motion failed for lack of second. to consider having the Planning Commission look at initiating a um, text amendment to the uh, permitted and conditional use table to allow that in the existing R4 zone for that type of use? I don't see that that makes any sense. Well, it would keep it from being rezoned to industrial. Yeah. But I think it's clear that we don't want to have it right there. Okay, that particular thing, not the land use. <coughs> Okay, I just wanted to ask that. Okay. Next item on the agenda, item D, consider approving and signing the 2018 Tree City recertification application. Our tree board president. I'm Leslie Fox, Chairman of the Independence Tree Board. 
we have um, prepared all the necessary paperwork and are ready for your approval to reapply for Tree City USA status for 2019. So this is an annual thing. Yep, we got to do this every year. Okay. Did we ever get our signs up? I don't think we have yet. No. I don't think so. It's either. in I'm, process. I've never seen them. Yeah. Have we got the signs? We do. Have, we have two signs, and we want to get two more. That way, we can have it at all four entrances to uh, Independence. What are some activities that the tree board has planned to? spur tree growth or tree planting for the next year mm -hmm. um well we're going to do another arbor day celebration and um we've decided to um uh volunteer our time to help out <coughs> with the maintenance of the downtown trees once a month this next year uh, just mostly during the summer and fall and we want to come up with a plan for how to help protect the downtown trees from the from Neowalla <laughs> and what happens <laughs> at Neowalla I would throw in that the uh, tree board volunteered to take care of the community orchard last summer and did a spectacular job I got compliments yes. all the time on how good it looked thank you I will continue that. to take care of the community orchard this next year Have you looked about at the trees along Oak Street where the medians are of trying to get some trees established there to kind of the old ones look kind of weathered? We did or? talk about that briefly. The trees <coughs> probably will have to be replaced mm -hmm. was the Yeah. So we'll we can look into that. So according to our information, the the tree program costs no additional funds no we they don't we're able to utilize funds that are already in the budget yes uh, for maintaining limb removal brush and pick up so that by being certified uh, as a tree city it's no yes. additional funds required yeah all of the all of the funds in the budget are already funds that the city has already proved okay. through other means so any further questions if not i'll entertain a motion i move that we approve the uh, 2018 tree city recertification application and uh, authorize the mayor to sign it second i have a motion and a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carried thank, thank you, you sir thank you appreciate all you guys are doing <clears throat> thank you next item on the agenda are city board minutes uh, any questions from the commission regarding any of the minutes? Uh, None. City manager comments? I have no comments in here. <clears throat> Commissioner comments? None for me. None for me. Let's see. I had some somewhere. Uh, two meetings back we I asked about the project bid schedules what what date was set for like the water treatment plant the Peter Pan Road and the ADA if anything had been set yeah, by the engineers uh, they may not have, I think they were in that report I handed out last week but uh, Peter Pan Road still the latest thing we got from the state still shows a march uh, bid date um, the water treatment plant uh, we opened bids today at 2 o'clock had three bidders so we'll be coming back with a recommendation on, on that contract mm -hmm. uh, on City Hall the bid opening for the phase one there will be February 7th okay <clears throat> um, or the on City Hall, are the plans available? Do you know? Uh, yes. Well, I have the bid 
advertising documents, plans, I guess I can ask. Um, well, I didn't know if we have notified local contractors yet, if the architect had done that, no, if we just they're barely, available we for We were the, just barely finalizing the timeline, getting that date okay. set for February 7th. We just got that. Uh, so he's putting that into the documents now. Um, and uh, but I, let me let me call him or talk, yeah. email him and see. You want the plans, not just the. I mean, the bid documents, I guess, have the plans, plans and the specs. And and specs you want. And I was more concerned about notifying local, local. area plumbers, sure. uh, general contractors that we can get more than one or two bidders. Yeah, he asked. He asked where do we advertise. Okay. Uh, and we gave that information. We typically advertise locally or in the paper and so forth. And uh, so he's putting that into his distribution. He's also putting it into a, uh, a CMG. Some, it, it's where contractors, service. especially outside yeah, the service. area, bid yeah. service type of a thing to see that. So they'll uh, hopefully have a get other bidders outside the area, but definitely locally is obviously. Mm -hmm. And on the website, you know, contractors. Do we mail notices to any of our yeah, They local? can sign up online and be automatically notified okay. Good. for any okay. bids that we have open. Okay. Uh, the last time we talked about the co-sponsoring partner, I guess I wasn't for, is that dead? Are we working on anything or is it just it, sitting? It's kind of sit, it's kind of sitting. It's just a time thing and priority, and you know. Uh, okay. I know we done some initial research. Kelly had done some initial research and looking for other examples. I found some samples. Um, we have looked at it. We just had other things that we've had to get done. So um, I haven't gotten that in a format to bring back to you guys yet. Okay, because I I'd contacted the league, and they said it is an issue that some of the cities are facing with groups coming around challenging that. And uh, Amanda Stanley did say that she was going to have a an aide try and work on a, a right. sample. But I've I've had some other things that I haven't got back with her yet. To yeah, we can check with the league. Amanda, say, yeah, say is working Amanda on. Stanley. <clears throat> um, uh, City Hall Phase Two and the direction for that, uh, looking at the emergency service, where we go, a general discussion. Commissioners, do we want to have that in a special meeting, or do we want to have a part of a commission meeting? I'd love to have a special meeting on that one. Okay. Myself. Yeah. Yep. Same here. <clears throat> okay. Let's consider consider. a special meeting. Uh, <coughs> let's get through. Say, let's bring it up to discussion at the first meeting in January. Get through all the holidays, Sounds and then good. we'll we'll look at setting a date that we can sit down, give us time to to go back through our our report from trainer, mm -hmm. uh, look at some of our previous information. And then we can have a direction. I think we need to look, you know, definitely phase two, uh, the emergency facility, and then also advertising maybe the sale of temporary city hall to start looking at that. But first meeting in January, we'll discuss a, a date, and that'll give us time to review okay. and be prepared. That sounds great. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's all the questions, comments that I had. <clears throat> uh, public concerns, we, did we get any notices? Okay. Then the next item on the uh, agenda is executive session and the motion will be I move that we recess for an executive session for discussion of employee performance pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception KSA 75-4319B1 uh, will be in, in two forms. First, uh, the commission, we need to conclude our previous uh, executive session for 
Um, we'll resume at 745. And this would be first with the three commissioners. So I've made a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carried. We're back in session. We're going to extend, let's say 10, another 10 minutes. Do I have a, With just the three commissioners? Yeah. Yep. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. So 10 minutes will be. 755. Okay. okay, we're back in session. We'd like to extend executive session for 30 minutes and resume at 8.30. Is that 30 minutes? 8.25. 8.25, okay. And be with the commissioners and the city manager. Okay. So we've got a motion, do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Yeah. Okay. We're back in, in session. Uh, there will be no public action taken from executive session tonight. That concludes our uh, meeting. I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. <clears throat>